that are um, the trochar into the maxillary sinus from the inferior meatus and flush um, and disimpact mucus. Uh, it's even better than saline flushes, but I like the, uh, the saline uh, thing. And this was a lecture series principally aimed at pediatric dentofacial management. There's a lot more to discuss uh, in adults. Um, and um, and then I've got another whole lecture, which we're going to leave completely. But if I can, um, I will just go to the very, very end. I'm just gonna flick this along. These are, this is a, a nasal lecture here. I'm just gonna flick it through. Um, they're conchobulosas. In fact, this one's this, here is a uh, an important slide too, which is be mindful of the four quadrant outcome. Okay, the outcome paradigm. Always aim for the top left hand corner, and so you want the happy patient and the proud surgeon. And in dentistry, it's just the same. That's what you want. Um, and I'm just going to flick things through here. These are various nasal. permutations that's an open rhinoplasty that we're doing um, but here is my most important take-home message which is that rhinoplasty is a metaphor of life and you want to strive for good balance it's the same in dentistry um, have a good family have a good extended family have some good mates that was me even uh, longer longer ago um, uh, climb up, yeah exactly climb a few mountains um, get into nature. Money is a lousy way of keeping score. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Um, be generous with your time, as uh, Simon's doing. Uh, look after your staff. There's me doing some yoga in theatre. Um, do some humanitarian work. Uh, this is in, the, uh, in Vanuatu. There's some big fella polyps that are coming out. Um, this is a person who had um, cystic fibrosis and nasal widening and she was unfit for an anesthetic so i under local anesthetic did triple osteotomies um and that's her six days later um that was a long time ago now and um sometimes i do a headstand at the at the end of the uh of the case of the end of the thing and yeah hopefully we have uh, only rainbows So we'll open up the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you, Perry. So let's uh, open up the questions. Simon, you want to kind of host and uh, maybe bring up Professor Singh as well to the front? Just a question about the boxes. You mentioned folks on the Zoom, if you want to type in your questions in the Q&A box. Oh, was it just like a decrease in oxygen saturation? Is that what you mean? Whereas yeah. apnea, when you stop breathing, isn't directly linked to bruxism because you stop breathing, but then it's the deoxygenation that's contributing to the sympathetic arousal? Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so basically... Sleep disorder breathing is a spectrum ranging from the mild social snoring that affects your spouse right through to a problem that affects you, which is major apnea of severe proportions. And we're all just trying to work out. So you can, you can order sleep studies on people, but you get a really good idea without doing a sleep study on how bad things are. And, and everything that you do, I uh, don't think that it, it should um, be confined to medicine. It should be just the same in, in dentistry. Everything has to sound concordant. Everything that someone tells you has to sound reasonable and it all has to fit in because we like sort of, we, we, we like symmetry and proportionality in our, in our, in our life. And, and, then, no, it's fine. Uh, and privately. So you, you want to, so you can get a pretty good idea of, what you think someone's sleep is like 
by A, talking to them and asking them, are they fatigued, et cetera? Okay. What sort of energy levels do they have? Are they falling asleep during the day? Are they any naps? Are they virtually nodding off in the car? You can get a, you examine them. So you work out, you know, have they got a totally bung nose, massive tonsils? Are they really retrogenic? Okay. So are they anatomically predisposed? Um, next thing, are they overweight? And then you get the spouse reports, you know, such and such stops breathing or he has these snorts or rousers or he has these protracted periods of apnea. So you get a pretty good idea of what you think, where the, along the spectrum they lie before you ever request a sleep study. And one of the, uh, the slides I had in my adult talk was that if I've got someone who is young and fit, who has anatomical issues that can be corrected, i.e. a bung nose or big tonsils, or they're very, very retrogenic, then I'll suggest that they actually have that corrected before I even do a sleep study. If they're overweight, if they've got comorbidities, if they're middle age or older, I'll always get a sleep study because I want to know how bad they are. Should I be monitoring them in HDU? But if someone's got what sounds like snoring, perhaps a bit of mild, mild apnea, but they've got a completely bung nose. Well, I know I'm going to make them a lot better. I know they're safe to, to be done uh, and be observed in the ward. So I don't go into a sleep study in those because I'm not doing research to have to document every case of mine and it'd just be more cost and, and inconvenience to the patient. So I have a very practical approach for them. But if I think they've got severe sleep apnea, yeah, absolutely. This, this this is when we have to invite a friend. We have to phone a friend because they need the sleep doctors um, involved. Absolutely. Deoxygenation, yeah, you deoxygenate, your brain doesn't like it. And so the ones that are not too bad are going to brux. And the ones that are really bad, they're going to have these massive arousals and they wake up. So it's just, it's just degrees of, would you agree, Narinda? Oh yeah, it was it was yeah it was just it was about bruxism and uh, we 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 talked we talked about that before. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, 